Well, good afternoon and good evening. My name is Sally Ann Lim, and I'm head of insights here at Spring Studios. In celebration of British Beauty Week, I'm delighted to welcome you to this event exploring the exciting future of beauty marketing. I'm going to be kicking things off with a short presentation, taking you through the five key trends and emerging opportunities that we've identified before inviting our expert panelists up into the stage to dive in a little bit more. And I should say, I'm also going to be allowing for about five, ten minutes at the end so that we can open the floor to any questions that you might have. So do keep those in mind. When reflecting on our theme for British Beauty Week, it struck us that the beauty industry is really uniquely placed to capitalize on the wealth of opportunities presented by digital acceleration and the advent of Web 3.0. It is highly individualized, requiring a really personal touch. It's a um, sensorially rich category, lending itself to immersive experiences and emotionally engaging narratives. And it inspires a huge amount of passion and loyalty from its fans. As a result, the emerging technologies and new frontiers provide exciting opportunities for beauty brands and beauty retailers alike, but when harnessed in the right way. Now, I think it's important to say at this juncture, we recognize that this space can feel really quite technically dense and often quite overwhelming due to the pace of innovation and novelty. And what we wanted to do with this event this evening is to really arm you with some tangible examples and principles that you can draw on as you think about your future marketing plans. Starting with number one, leverage the power of AR and AI to deliver a personalized beauty experience, both on and offline. Now, it's fair to say that compared to many other categories, the beauty industry was actually a fairly early adopter in terms of embracing AR or augmented reality, using it to facilitate try on both in store and online. And while AR try on can be super useful in its own right, avoiding things like unhygienic swatching, providing a more sustainable alternative to testers, and boosting confidence when shopping online, it's arguably when augmented reality is joined by artificial intelligence or AI that it proves most compelling. AI can help AR try on to be much more personalized and intuitive, providing tailored recommendations, whether that be for products or for shades, and even going so far as being able to provide diagnoses based on a specific user's individual needs and preferences. Looking to the future, it's going to be all about making the experience of this technology much more reflective of your brand and, crucially, integrating it at the right point in the customer journey to aid discovery and drive conversion. Um, a final point is that recognizing the value of the data that you get out of these processes and these interactions in terms of better understanding your consumers' needs and preferences, whether you use that to tailor your marketing messaging or even to inform your new product development pipeline where you recognize that you might have gaps or sort of opportunities in your lineup. Now, two examples to bring this to life. The first from Revive, who join us on the panel tonight. Earlier this year, they announced the launch of their, um, their AI hair care advisor, which they'd co-developed in collaboration with science-first hair care brand Living Proof. Now, people interacting with this tool and experience first input their specific hair care concerns and expectations. They then take a selfie, which is analyzed using patented mobile diagnostics to determine factors such as their hair type, their curl type, their color, their shade. And at the end, they ultimately receive their optimum hair care and styling routine thanks to a sophisticated AI recommendation machine. And on the right-hand side, we have an example from Polpo AR, who are also represented on our panel this evening. They've collaborated with Sephora to create a hyper-realistic AR and AI try-on experience that really leverages the best in both. And as a multi-brand retailer, Sephora's experience invites consumers to interact with over 1,500 different products from 22 of its best-selling brands. And it's available both in-store and online. Now, point number two feels like a natural progression from IR, AR try-on technologies, and it's all around anticipating mainstream adoption of virtual beauty looks. It's fair to say that we're all au fait with flattering filters on social media, some of us even guilty of extending their use into Zooms and Teams for that much-needed touch-up during hours of virtual calls. Well, as we spend more and more time in the metaverse, 
beauty brands and retailers should expect that people will expect their virtual selves to not only reflect their sartorial preferences, but their beauty ones too. CGI has come on leaps and bounds in terms of facilitating interaction with these sorts of virtual beauty looks. So whether you choose to use it to sympathetically enhance your natural aesthetic or embrace a more surrealist look, really taking advantage of the hyper-creative forms of self-expression that are possible in the metaverse. And this could also have some important implications for both beauty brands and also makeup artists who may want to look to translate their IRL skills into the virtual realm. And this could potentially create new revenue streams for people wanting to purchase these virtual beauty looks for use on their avatars. Um, you know, it's similar to, I guess, what we're starting to see in the world of virtual fashion, where that's a little bit more advanced and progressed. So two examples here to just give you a bit of a flavor. On the left-hand side, digital fashion startup Artifact have partnered with luxury fragrance brand Byredo for a perfume designed for the Web3 world. Together, as part of the Alpha Meta uh, collaboration, the brands have visually rendered 26 different ingredients, each representing a different emotion. Now, these fragrances will be available as limited edition physical scents, but they're also going to be treated as digital collectibles, including a virtual scent aura that can be worn by your avatar in the metaverse. And on the right-hand side, in March of this year, as part of Decentraland's first Metaverse Fashion Week, Estee Lauder invited visitors to step inside its iconic advanced night repair little brown bottle. And in so doing, they were able to unlock a wearable NFT of this glowy radiant aura that you can see here, really kind of mimicking and nodding to the real life product benefit. So, although a bit novel, I think it's really interesting because, of course, Advanced Night Repair is a cult product for all diehard beauty fans. But this metaverse activation gave Estee Lauder an opportunity to introduce the brand and also the franchise to a new audience. Number three kind of evolves from this, so it's all about embracing these metaverse game states, such as Decentraland, as a new frontier for beauty discovery. In recent months, we've seen a number of beauty brands pop up on platforms like Roblox and Decentraland, but I think it's important to say that the most successful entrants don't just pop up and stand there, they're actually really leaning into the dynamics of these spaces, working with native creators um, to translate their core brand codes and values into these new gamescapes. In order to drive engagement, they often create challenges to engage and encourage a continued gameplay, often unlocking new features and rewards over time, including things like avatar wearables, such as we saw with the example from Estee Lauder, but also sometimes perks and products that actually need to be redeemed in real life, driving synergy between the virtual and physical realms. So three examples that actually just come from maybe even the last three months. Uh, complete with a castle, its own metro station, and a pool, the Givenchy Beauty House invites players to compete in virtual makeup contests in order to win virtual accessories that they can wear on their avatar, all while, of course, learning about the house's signature scents and iconic hero franchises. In the middle, in July of this year, NARS announced a 90-day activation on Roblox called NARS Color Quest. Its four most iconic franchises are represented by four virtual tropical islands that users can explore and compete in product-themed challenges in order to earn badges and virtual currency that they can then use to buy beauty looks. And they are constantly refreshing it, so new rewards and new challenges are being revealed every few weeks to encourage people to come back and play this again and again. Again. And finally, on the right-hand side, just last month, Gucci's latest Flora fragrance dropped in its Roblox town, complete with a Miley Cyrus avatar, a scavenger hunt that encouraged gamers to learn more about the scent, a selfie wall, and even a cute wearable fragrance bottle backpack that you could purchase and then wear on uh, Roblox as your avatar. Point number four, so I've mentioned NFTs a couple of times so far in this presentation, but there's one particular usage that we think is potentially really interesting, and that's all about using NFTs to unlock the future of beauty loyalty. Since 2021, the NFT conversation has gone from peripheral to front page, and many of the brands experimenting in this space are really harnessing the potential of physical and digital rewards as an enhanced dimension of NFT ownership. 
this new dynamic opens up opportunities for beauty brands and retailers to really elevate their loyalty by taking perks and benefits beyond the transactional to actually create real cultural value, whether that be first access to new products or to events or even to communities, both on and offline. And I think what's interesting is that because specific perks typically aren't revealed in advance, NFTs offer the opportunity to nurture an ongoing relationship with beauty loyalists, surprising and delighting them by engaging with them in a much more fluid manner. So not the brand that I necessarily thought I'd feature, but actually Clinique did something really interesting with their debut NFT. Rather than making it avail for, available for sale, they made it exclusively available to existing members of its loyalty scheme who were able to compete to win an NFT artwork called the Meta Optimist by sharing their own, own personal stories of optimism on social media. The people that won this NFT artwork didn't only get the artwork, but it was actually later revealed that that was also a token that enabled them to access 10 years worth of free Clinique product. So I think the Clinique product, the Clinique approach is really interesting because it focused on social currency, empowering its most loyal fans to use their content as a gateway. They also focused on the utility of the NFT, as I mentioned, so engaging the community by creating value both virtually through the form of these social conversations and this digital artwork, but also physically by giving the winners actual tangible physical products. And point number five is perhaps the most future-facing and future-gazing of the points that we have today, and it's all about cultivating the beauty community in Web 3.0. So these days, people want to buy into, not just buy from, brands. And decentralized autonomous organizations, or DAOs for short, actually provide the mechanics to enable people to own a piece of the brand. So it's going beyond value alignment to actually give them a tangible stake. This collective ownership model is being pioneered as a way for brands to deeply engage with and to nurture their communities, creating a powerful audience of advocates and providing opportunities for brands to tap into and also crucially reward their creator networks, something that really nicely aligns, of course, with the dynamics of both beauty brands and beauty lovers. And while it's fair to say that the DAO space is still fairly nascent in terms of brand experimentation, what seems to be clear is that those who are able to really leverage the full potential of DAOs will be able to be ahead of the game when it comes to consumer-created content and engagement. So one final example for you on this point, created by the uh, cosmetic company NYX, Gorgeous has been described as the world's first beauty DAO, focused on fostering the development of the 3T artist community and evolving approaches to make up in the metaverse. Gorgeous will serve as a launchpad for 3D creators with the intent to grow and promote the in innovation within the community, increase aptitude in digital makeup, and ultimately champion these artists' careers. Gorgeous will also to help to define what beauty will actually be in the metaverse and lead that cultural conversation as it relates to the values of diversity, inclusivity, and accessibility. And so those are our kind of five key trends and emerging opportunities. It's fair to say that there is a wealth of opportunity out there, but I think it's important to say at this juncture that certainly as spring, we don't advise that you just blindly jump on the bandwagon. I'm sure the panelists will reinforce this point, but it's really about reinforcing and making sure that you have the right foundations in, in place and also that you're really clear on your objectives so that you can help to identify the right, of this wealth, the right one out of this wealth of opportunities for you and your brand. And so on that note, I'd love to invite my panelists to join me on the stage. Great, so obviously lots of themes there. Um, could I just ask you briefly to introduce yourselves, if that's okay, perhaps I can start with you, James. Sure, hi everyone, my name's James Watson. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for the Glimpse Group. Um, we're an immersive technology company, uh, NASDAQ listed, so we're based out in New York. Um, and within the Glimpse Group, there are 13 subsidiaries, um, all with various immersive technology offerings from virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, we kind of cover everything. Um, and one of those subsidiaries within that is um, 
uh, an organization that we basically look into the, the whole um, the fashion piece and have virtual try-on technology within that. So we have a company called QReal who create 3D assets uh, within that space. Um, and then we have Pulpo AR who have this virtual try-on technology and they've worked as uh, you saw some of the examples, they've worked with Sephora uh, amongst other brands. So yeah. We've got lots of different offerings in this space, and um, I'm really looking forward to, to having this discussion. Great. And Danielle? Hi, I'm Danielle Watson. We're not related or married, by the way. Um, <laughs> Same class. <laughs> Same, Same class. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I work for Revive. Um, our head office is based out of Helsinki, and I work as the um, sales director for EMEA, um, with a focus on the UK, France, Italy, and Switzerland predominantly. Um, we specialize in AI. We offer advisor solutions, coach solutions, and makeup VTO. And today I'm going to be talking about how AI and AR can help on digital transformation journey for brands and retailers. Great. And Duncan, for those who aren't familiar already. Hi, I am uh, Duncan. I am a creative director with um, 17 years of working in uh, editorial fashion, um, agency retail. But in the last couple of years, I started transitioning into this space, um, working on some startups to do with NFTs and fashion, and then have recently joined Spring as a creative technologist heading up an innovation unit called Spring Labs. Um, and our, our focus is really to, to test and learn and to help our clients understand this space and, and, and kind of guide them as to how they can enter it in, a, in the best way possible. Great. So the very first thing I touched on in that presentation was obviously AR try-on, and I mentioned the fact that beauty was actually quite ahead of the curve, and also obviously it's been further accelerated by the pandemic. But what I'd love to understand is a bit more about the role of AR try-on as it stands today, and also where you see it evolving in the future. And perhaps, James, I can come to you first on that one. Yeah, I mean, you're right that you know, the beauty industry was uh, ahead of the curve to a degree. I think that curve has probably flattened out a bit now. And I think we're still at very early stages. To me, the value it brings is, is less the sort of gimmickry of, of sort of being a novel piece of technology. I think really it's how you integrate it into the overall journey as a whole. And you know, the great thing about technology, it's fun, it's cool, everyone wants to do it new shiny toy, let's play around with it. But it's really, you know, the, the mantra I look at any technology, be it in the beauty industry, be it in, in other sectors, is what value is that bringing? Uh, and I think, you know, virtual try-on is at a stage where it's starting to, you know, if you think with all the sort of the, the lenses that people play around with, it's becoming far more part of normal life of people doing these things. So as they see it integrated into their sort of buying journey or their exploration, it becomes more natural for them to use it. But I think we're, we're still at quite early stages. Uh, and I think it's about working out what value it brings into that chain uh, and not just dropping it in as a, as a cool new shiny toy, uh, which is often the danger. Because you do that, and people go, yeah, that was fun, not really sure what value that gave me. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of write it off. And once you've written it off once, it's really hard to bring those people back. Oh, yeah, I tried it. It wasn't really that good. It didn't come out with a very good result, or it didn't really add to my experience. They're then really hard to bring back. So you've got to do it properly. You know, Take your time, be considered. So it, it's got great potential, but it's early, and it needs to be done in the right way is the message. Great. And Danielle, I saw you nodding in agreement with a few of those points. Anything else to add from your perspective? Yeah, I, I, I agree with a lot of what James has just said. And um, it's definitely just one tool of a lot of different tools that are available out there, but it seems to be the most popular at the moment. Um, and just re-emphasizing what James said, it's about brands and retailers understanding what are your key objectives if you take this on board. We were actually chatting earlier. And for me, it's very much an exploration tool so the lady who's been wearing the same makeup from the 80s has now wanting to explore and try something new and get away from wearing a very vivid, you know, light, very light pink colour and she wants to explore with Charlotte Tilbury or she wants to try with another brand. So it's just giving um, consumers more confidence across all, um, you know, ages, ac across everybody, giving them the chance to just play and experiment before they actually make the purchase. And I think as well, 
this just scratches like the surface of what AR can bring to the table as well. Um, we've seen a fundamental shift from transactional driven commerce, which is now very much relationship driven commerce. Um, and that's delivering a seamless end to end journey. Um, and again, James and I were chatting, there's a lot of companies out there that are delivering solutions that can help, but they're actually not delivering a full end to end journey. So that's just, you know, a little bit of insight there. And then one of the other things I went on to talk about was this interaction between AI and AR. Um, and so obviously artificial intelligence is an interesting one because beauty is such an inherently personal category in which I think people want that human touch. So what is the role and how can you leverage the power of AI while still making sure it feels really human and inspiring? Shall I go? Sure. Okay. So obviously, it's got to be realistic, it has to be inclusive uh, for everybody, and it's got to be accessible. So it's not necessarily about replacing human beings, but it's actually being an extension and enhancing that experience. So for new like beauty advisors, for example, it can really help give them confidence and show that they're actually an expert in what they're talking about. Um, I know I'm sat here, we're sat here with our yeah. iPads and they're just helping, you know, keep you on the, uh, guiding you yeah. to move forward. And I think that's also what this kind of technology can offer as well. I, I think if, if there's enough value in a technology. So when our, an AI is, is kind of a pet hate term of mine, because I think we misuse it massively. And it's kind of we're at a sort of machine learning type stage. So the AI thing comes further on. But it's an easy label to put on it, but people misuse it. I'm not saying you are right now. Not badly anyway. <laughs> but some people misuse it really badly. They sort of their product suddenly has got AI in and they can charge ten times the price and you know raise more money because it's got AI in, which is generally not really true. Um, I think if there's enough value in it, that human touch thing I think is less important. I think as we look ahead, if, if you can go online, use Revive or, or whatever and, and get a really good result, for some people that's fine. You know, you don't need this kind of, you know, journey where you then go and talk to someone or, or have that human interaction. And I think, you know, as the younger generations come up through the ranks, I don't think they'll care so much about it if they get real value from that technology. If they can get an amazing result and get the perfect recommendation and just hit a button and buy it, do they need that different experience? So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not as black and white as that, but, but I think if there's value in it, I think the human touch becomes less important if they get a good result. And then I took a bit of a bold leap from AR try-on to actual virtual beauty looks that one might wear in the metaverse. And we did see some interesting experiments happening from Byredo and Artifact and Estee Lauder, even in advanced night repair. Um, but how do you see the space evolving for virtual beauty? And is there a space for virtual beauty? Duncan, big question. Um, how do I see it evolving? I think the most interesting thing from a creative point of view is that we don't really know how it's going to evolve yet. And I think that's really exciting to explore. So I was talking to Sally about this the other day, and I think I mentioned the, the comparison of when digital cameras first came out. Um, there was this whole thing of like, oh, but we're not going to have printed photos anymore. And for a while, that was a big concern. And, and it even became a business where people sold, you know, you could get your digital photos printed or printed into photo books. We're trying to replicate what we know. Um, and then, you know, new technology arrived. Suddenly, you know, with the smartphone, you've got a photo album in your pocket. You don't need a photo album. Well, you, you might still want one, but you don't need one. And then, you know, social media, again, that's also like, that's like a photo album that you share with the world, you know. So within a few years, the way that we perceived a digital image culturally transformed in a way that we could never have predicted or, or even begun to imagine, you know, we would never have imagined in Instagram and how big it would become, you know, in 2005. Um, so, you know, I think we're in that stage with, with this technology and, and with the metaverse and with NFTs and, and we're actually, it's going to develop in ways that we can't even begin to, you know, fathom right now. And I think the Byredo uh, artifact example is really interesting because as, as, as gimmicky as it may look, and I, did, I, mean, I noted some snickers in the room when, when the, the aura came up, and I get it, because I, I, you know, I think the same to a degree, but it, we have to remember it's not, it's not aimed at us, it's aimed at you know, the kids that are playing Roblox who are going to kind of come up 
with that brand relationship because of that aura. But the point being that um, you are, uh, <laughs> so I just lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, you're, you're taking something that you're perceived limits of the world, i.e., you know, in this world you can't have an aura. So therefore, when you think about doing a perfume in the, in the uh, metaverse, you think, we can't do a perfume, you can't see it. But somebody made that decision to make that creative leap and think, you can have an aura in the metaverse because there are no rules. And that's actually huge. And that just kicks open the door to a massive wealth of more creative experimentation that we can see. And I think that over the next few years, it's going to keep evolving in ways that we can't imagine yet. Great. Anything else to add to that from our other panelists, James, Danielle? There are some silly things that go on. <laughs> of course. You know, but they are for kids mostly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, it's, and it's a proof of concept as well. Yeah. Right? They're just trying to try stuff, see how yeah. it goes. That didn't take off. Let's try a different route. But, you know, so, yeah, I have to park the cynic. Of course. The, I mean, I, I watched my niece playing Roblox for the first time, you know, a, a year or so ago. And having previously gone on it myself and not understood it, and been a bit like, oh, this is a bit crap. Like, I watched how engaged she was, and she played this game where you got to dress an avatar um, in like three minutes, and then you did a catwalk show. And she was so into it. And within, within like a few minutes, she was asking to buy the digital currency Robux for the game. She was, can you buy me some? Can you, you know? And I just thought, OK, this is something really big here. And perhaps in lieu of having your niece here in the room today, um, as a <laughs> representative for Gen Alpha who are on Roblox, could you give us just a little bit of the lay of the land? You know, what is Web3, what is Metaverse, and where do these gaming platforms live in that world? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Web3 and the Metaverse are two things that often get kind of conflated. They are different, and I think people often refer to, you know, the Metaverse as being part of Web3 and vice versa. And, um, I'll go super top line. I, I don't want to, you know, I'm sure some people in the room know this really well, so I won't go into detail. But, you know, Web3 is essentially the third generation of, of web technology. So if you think of Web1 being, you know, the World Wide Web, as it stood in the 90s and early noughties potentially, where you would go online and you would type in World War II and you would find a blog that someone had written about a battle in World War II. You couldn't interact with it anyway, it was just a page of information. Web 2 kind of came around in about 2005 when it became more about social media and engaging and interacting and user-generated content. So that was uh, the Web 2 era. And now what we're moving into now is Web 3. And Web 3 is very much a philosophy for how the internet should work, how people would like to see it work. And it has a lot to do with taking away the power from big corporations, essentially, the, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world. So what they call it, hence you know, a DAO, is, is decentralization. Um, you're looking at you know, a company like Facebook, which obviously has a, a hierarchical system. People at the top are making billions. The people at the bottom are not making as much. And then you've got the people who are actually making it successful, not earning anything at all from our own content or anything like that. So the people who really believe in Web3 want to decentralize the power and make it so that the people who are creating the content, the people who are um, doing the interesting things, are benefiting, it, benefiting from it. And the technology that powers that is, is you know, obviously blockchain, crypto, you know, NFTs, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which we'll probably talk more about later. Um, by comparison, the metaverse is not necessarily web free. The metaverse, in its simplified terms, is just a 3D interpretation of the internet. And recently someone asked me if, if meta, i.e. Facebook meta, own the metaverse. And obviously the answer is no. Uh, no one owns the metaverse. The metaverse is like the internet, you know, lots of, or, or social media. There's lots of social media companies, but that no one owns social media, you know, so the metaverse is a 3D representation of the internet where you can go, you can interact with friends, you can see shows, you can play games, et cetera, et cetera. So Web3 and the metaverse don't have to rely on each other, but they do complement each other. And I think, you know, the Web3 people definitely want to see the metaverse go more in that direction. And I guess one of the things we touched on in the presentation is brands like Gucci and Givenchy and Nas who are getting into these Roblox and Decentraland gaming platforms within the metaverse space. Um, what do we think the opportunity is for beauty brands on these kind of gaming platforms specifically? 
Me again? Yeah. <laughs> or some principles. If I was a brand wanting to get into this space, what would I need to think about and consider? Um, well, where do I start? So I think the key thing is, is to tread carefully. So I mean, we, it's all about community. And I think that's something that people misun misunderstand or, or underestimate a lot. Um, there was this, this sense in 2001 that, you know, or 2020, 2021, uh, that, you know, you could basically do anything. You could mint anything and it would, you'd make a load of money. And to a degree, there was some truth to that. But that kind of bubble has popped. And now the people who are left in, in this world after the crypto crash are really passionate about this and they're very protective over over people coming into what they feel is their world and, and trying to benefit from it. So treading carefully, doing your due diligence, not thinking about what value you can strip out of it, but what value you can add and how you can give back to the community and, and help nurture it um, is, is really important. And obviously, um, James and Danielle, you have kind of products which are focused more squarely on the, on the beauty category and the applications of this technology. Do you see ways in which your sort of AR and AI try-on solutions could evolve into this game space or even virtual beauty looks? I'll let you take that one. Oh, OK. Um, f first up, a couple of things. Um, the metaverse doesn't exist <laughs> currently you in any be, meaningful be, way, just so future, pe people yeah. are aware of that. Um, I disagree that it's, it's a 3D version of the web. I think it's sort of exploding the web and interacting in completely different ways. Um, and it kind of makes me laugh when, when brands say we're active in the metaverse. And, and I know you have to. So there's this terrible part of me that goes, it doesn't exist, this is all bullshit. And then there's this other part of me that goes, but actually it makes a lot of sense and it's really good from a marketing perspective to talk about it, right? But you know, ultimately what they're doing with Roblox, the a majority of Roblox users access it on desktop, right? So, it's, so let's think back, Second Life. A lot of people know Second Life. It's still around, amazingly enough. What, 15, 20 years ago? It was a big thing. That, that wasn't the metaverse then, still isn't the metaverse, and, and yet we talk about Roblox or Sandbox VR or whatever as, as the metaverse. These are, these are desktop ways of interacting. So I just think at the moment, there's so much, so much is unclear, understandably, because and it, in 10, 15 years' time, this is going to be incredible. We will have very lightweight headsets on that sort of overlay into the real world, probably flip a switch. We have a VR version where you're completely you know, locked into an experience. You're seeing your grandmother from Australia volumetrically captured there as though you're there. It will be amazing. Is it 10 years? Is it 15? Is it 20? I don't know. So I think at the moment, there's lots of playing around with it. Um, and I think it has got value and you need to test the market, you need to do these things and go into it. Um, but how it all fits together at the moment, it's, to me it's just these little, little sort of trials that pop up and you do and it's quite fun and it's a bit gimmicky and we're learning, but I think the real value in it is, is further down the track and um, I probably didn't really answer your question there to be fair. <laughs> But I just kind of think, you know, the context of it is, is, is really important. You know, we, um, we can't get too carried away with it. We've got to sort of, you know, embrace it, but embrace it in a sort of pragmatic way. Otherwise, back to my previous point, people get super excited. There's a law called Amara's Law, which is really interesting. People overexpect um, from uh, new technology developments in the short run. They think this is going to change everything. This is incredible. And then they go, actually, it's not changing anything. It's a bit rubbish. And they forget about it. But actually, that technology keeps going. And it does actually come to fulfill some amazing things in the future. So um, yeah. Watch this space. Yeah, that was a bit of a ramble, but you know. No, hey. It's true, because if, I mean, I heard this on a podcast. I'm not going to claim this as my own uh, comment, but they talked about if, if the, you know, if you wrote the metaverse off now, you'd effectively be writing off the internet in like 1989. Yeah. yeah before you know, Amazon existed, Facebook existed, like yeah. Google existed, all these things. It's, it's in such early stages. Totally. It's just, it's just framing it in the right way that people don't kind of just think it's going to change everything tomorrow. It will, not tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I think something really important from my perspective and who we speak to is a lot of people are scared to death of that M word. And we were chatting, laughing earlier. When you mentioned the, the word metaverse, like you said, some people don't actually know what it means. They can't connect the docs. So they don't know where to start. They don't know which part of the ecosystem they're sitting in and what connects with what. So when you pull it all back as well, it's like, don't be scared. 
you know, going back to what are your key objectives? What do you want to get out of this? Do you want to reward them? Do you want to get to know them on a deeper level? Do you want to give them a 360 experience in store and online, but without even touching on what Duncan and James have been saying? So just my two pence. No, absolutely. And then my fourth point was really around the opportunity for loyalty and beauty. Um, and I sort of started with NFTs, but I know, Danielle, when we spoke in advance of this panel, you had a really interesting point about actually how yeah. interacting with an advisor can be part of that. Yeah, I think the customer loyalty part is really important because when you've got that level of understanding so deep about your consumer, you can basically reward them because you're getting to know everything about them, everything's more personalized, and the word personalization is on the tip of everybody's tongue, it's still on the tip of everybody's tongue, and it's how brands and retailers can just get a deeper level of understanding about that consumer, what interests them, what intrigues them, and how they can benefit from believing in that brand. Um, yeah. And then the other opportunity I pointed to is the potential of NFTs for loyalty. Um, Duncan, can you give us a bit of a 101 on what an NFT is and then potentially sort of what that means from a loyalty perspective and the opportunities there? Yep. Um, so, again, just going com back to complete basics. Uh, so an NFT is a non-fungible non token. Very strange collection of words. Uh, fungible is a very <laughs> strange word indeed. So fungible um, means that if, if something is basically one unit of a product is equivalent to another unit of the same product. So for example, if someone owes you one pound, you don't care what pound coin you get as long as you get a pound coin. You know, Non-fungible means it can't just be replaced with, with something else like for like. So you know, if I drew a picture of the Mona Lisa and walked into the Louvre and put mine up and took theirs down, they would have an issue with it because you can't just replace the Mona Lisa with another drawing of the Mona Lisa. So it's that kind of perceived value. Um, it, it came into the, the public mind, obviously, through art predominantly in, in 20, 2020, 2021, lots of big art sales. And I think that really speaks to the, the nature of Web3 and that kind of taking back of the power. Um, a lot of people, you know, the art world, very elitist. Uh, traditionally, you know, galleries and et cetera, et cetera. Um, the way that they did it is they're taking the power back from the galleries and they're allowing the artists themselves to sell their own work in that way. So that's why it became so big with art to start with. Um, but now, you know, the word token is a bit of a hint. It can be a gateway to other experiences, and more and more brands are starting to do that. They're starting to use the NFT as just a way to unlock things that you can give people either digitally or in real life. And I think you touched on it in your presentation already, but you know, it could be concert tickets, it could be um, VIP experiences, it could be digital wearables, it could be makeup, it could be anything, mm -hmm. basically. But it's like a supercharged loyalty scheme um, for you know, a new, new era. James, I feel like I have to come to you to see if you'd like to debunk anything <laughs> or challenge. <laughs> Healthy debate. I mean, listen, it's absolutely valid. You know, uh, NFTs are a thing. I don't think anyone really understands where they're going to go. You know, Board Ape Yacht Club and all their, you know, millions of dollars they're charging for those things. I think it's very interesting. I think there is a concern in the market. Look at what's happening to the crypto market over the past few months, which has, I think, dropped by two thirds or something. I think there's a concern that it could be a bit of a bubble, a bit of a gimmicky piece. I think what it might be is, is the sort of principles that adhere to NFTs, how they're created, the value. Maybe that will permeate into other areas and you'll kind of be learning from that and you'll look back at NFTs and go, oh yeah, that was a good start, but actually it's turned into something you know that's that has more value so i totally get it at the moment and i think brands need to look at it even if it's just a tap into the zeitgeist at the moment mm. um you know how long it stays around where we'll be in five years time it might be an evolution of nfts something will exist I but it might not be agree. that it'll be i think that they'll get to a point where we'll stop even using the word yeah. nft yeah exactly you know, all so. words yeah. it's um like you say, I think, you know, the, the Bored Ape stuff you mentioned is, is really interesting because obviously those were given away for free to start with and they've gone on to become these crazily expensive things. But um, I think that people will move, I think for a brand now to be like, oh, we're going to get an artist and do an NFT, it's like, it's done, that, that yeah. ship has sailed, you know, but, you know, 
treating it as a way to, to garner loyalty, to reward people, and potentially even stop referring to it as an NFT in time, yeah. I definitely. Yeah, I agree. And my final point was around community and, and what that means to build beauty communities in the Web3 world. I think there's some principles that have actually come out of the conversation thus far, but is there anything else that you'd add about what you need to know for translating and evolving your beauty community in this new world? Me? Yeah. Anybody want to go first? Um, I don't think you do hugely different things yeah. than you're already doing currently. Yeah. I think you kind of, you know, as you treat your customers and drive loyalty, I think you just use it as a different tool in that box we talked about. It's, you know, mm -hmm. all this technology is, is another tool in the toolbox. It's yeah. not a silver bullet. It's not going to change everything, no matter what you're told. So I think it's just, you know, applying what you know already and how you fit an NFT or whatever into that overall kind of picture of how you're driving loyalty. So I think it's, you know, don't, don't reinvent um, the playbook on this. You know, just slot it in and see where it fits. Yeah, I mean, I 100% I agree. I, from a personal point of view as a, as, a, as a creative, I would like to see brands stop treating, you know, NFTs, metaverse games as a campaign moment and just start to play around with it and experiment more and kind of have more fun with it. And as I say, test and learn, see what, see what fits and, and stop pinning stuff on you know, a big campaign moment, we partnered up with this artist and we're going to do this. And, you know, I think it's a very easy way for brands to kind of virtue signal in a way and be like, we're doing this and we're representing these people and stuff. But it's actually just a really great tool to experiment and, and see, what, see what sticks. And I think Forever 21 fashion a brand, not beauty, but they did a really interesting thing in Roblox where they made this beanie, it just says forever on it, and they sold it for $5. And I think it cost them like 500 quid to make this 3D model. And they've sold about $700,000 worth of these $5 beanies. Um, and now it's been so successful and become such a trend that they're actually going to make physical versions of these beanies that they're gonna sell in their stores, you know. And I think that's a really interesting case study because it's actually that experimenting in that world um, and, and seeing what works and then taking it to our world. It's a very cheap and effective way to, to kind of explore stuff with your, with your audience and your market, see what works. And I think especially with these auras and stuff, I could imagine if an aura became, you know, a really <laughs> high selling aura, sounds like a really stupid concept, but, you know, and it had, it had a gimmicky name and a catchy name, and then they made a real life perfume of that, mm -hmm. you know, doing it the other way around to what they're doing now, you know, there would be 10, 12 year old kids who, who would definitely want to buy that. And then, you know, they're building that relationship with their brand very authentically on a peer to peer level, as opposed to a brand to, con to customer yeah. level. Great. Well, that feels like a good place to close the panel discussion. I am conscious that I did promise that I would open the floor to any questions. So we have a roving mic. Um, if anybody has any questions they'd like to address to any of our panelists or any questions about the presentation, please stick your hands up and Emily will come to you. Hello. Um, thank you for that. Um, my question is around um, kind of security and things that we need to be kind of, I guess, mindful of, you know, in your words around Web 2 and how with social media, it was a little bit, you know, it kind of developed at such a pace where we had so many issues that we're still dealing with and the likes of Instagram, etc. In the wake of Web3 and all of the amazing opportunities we're seeing for beauty brands at the moment to go into AR, meta, 3D platforms, etc. Are there any kind of key takeaways that we should consider for beauty consumers and for beauty brands that we need to be aware of when producing creative and producing these communities? Um, I imagine the kind of like e-crime and everything is being built at the same time, but it'd be good if there was any advice on that area um, to make sure that we create a safe environment for communities and a really great experience for brands as well. So creating a safe environment in this brave new world, um, does anybody have a point of view on that? I mean, I, I'm definitely not you know, an expert in security uh, around you know, that kind of stuff, but I have heard recently that, I mean, it is a hot topic. 
is something that's being discussed a lot. And I think I may be incorrect, but I'm pretty sure that recently it was announced that a lot of these big companies like Roblox and stuff have formed some sort of um, initiative where they're working together to make sure that this space is safe, um, that people aren't being, you know, manipulated or, you know, anything, anything dodgy, basically. So I think that is something that is, is very much a hot topic at the moment and is going on at the moment. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I personally am not entirely sure what I can add to it from a security point of view. But I know that Web3 is obviously very, very concerned with with all of that stuff. That's kind of the whole ethos of it. So the more that, you know, the, the, the games and the, you know, grow towards the, the, the version of the metaverse that, that we I don't even know from films like The Matrix or books like Snow Crash or, or whatever, I think that the more they integrate with Web3, the more that kind of ethos will, will permeate. That organization you talk about is um, the Metaverse Strategic Forum, I think it's called, and we're members of it. I mean, lots of companies are, but, but we are. Um, so that's the initiative they're doing. But, but I think to your point from security, um, something I've been looking into recently, which is quite interesting, it's quite a broad one, but is self-sovereign identity. So obviously based on Web 3.0, blockchain or whatever, you, you as a user, and it's not really helping you from a sort of how do you create perspective, but it'll help as we move around in whatever the metaverse becomes, but you in effect choose what information you share with different organizations. So that's you know, the self-sovereign idea, which I think is really interesting rather than just sort of, you know, Facebook or whatever, give me all your details. It's like, well, this is what I'll share with you. This is what I'll share with the DVLA for my driver's license. This is what I'll share with my bank. So you're in control a bit of that sort of, and that I think is sort of a big part of Web 3.0 is, is, is that sort of ownership of which, you know, should make things more secure. But obviously, as that evolves, the ability to hack this evolves as well. So it's always a bit of a race. So, you know, we'll have to see. Great, thank you. Any more questions at all from the audience? I can see a hand, well, two hands. Emily, whoever you can get to first. <laughs> Hiya. Hi, Robin. Hiya, nice to see you, sir. Um, two points, really. I think um, I've gone completely out of my head when I got handed the mic and you said hello. But the uh, one is about um, it was something that came across when I was at Spring. The idea of virtual reality encourages virtual consumption. So um, it used to be the cheapest thing you could buy from Chanel was a lipstick. Now the cheapest thing you can buy from Chanel is follow them on Instagram, which is free. Um, we're creating an awful lot of low-value digital products, and it doesn't always convert very well. I want to have some thoughts on that. Virtual reality encouraging people don't buy anything. They just put the hat on on Roblox. Um, and, um, but... And the other one is, and I'll just put it together, maybe you can roll it together, is that specifically about virtual Tron technology, and it's, it, it, it turns everything into a, uh, everything turns into a, um, what do you call it, like a low-grade shopping experience. You just try everything on. And the role of beauty brands historically has been top-down, incredible, you know, whether it's Estee Lauder or Helena Rubenstein, and the role of like a curator is lost a lot in virtual Tron. Everything turns into a, a store counter. So just some thoughts on that, really. Virtual consumption and how virtual Tron fits into a top-down brand. I think something that I'll mention here is that there's two different types of virtual Tron that I see. So one is the gamification. And I've been into Chanel at Amsterdam Airport at Christmas, and I wanted to buy a lipstick, and I thought, oh, I'm going to try this. It's not our technology, but I'm going to try it. And I looked like pantomime dame. And there's no way I was going to spend all that money buying that lipstick because it just didn't look right on me. So what we try to do as a business is be real. And I think what we've seen since after the pandemic is that people are focused on what's going in is going to come out. And it's about the real you. And it's about looking after you and projecting the real you. So our technology is, has got nothing to do with gamification. We don't do any filters for Snapchat or anything. It's all about seeing your real face, having a swift selfie analysis of you. And then you will then try on the makeup, but we try to keep it looking as natural as possible. So that's just from our perspective in the, you know, in the AI field. Uh, I'll take the virtual consumption thing. Uh, why do you feel people using VR need to consume something? 
All right. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think if you're trying to sell something in VR, you've probably missed the point of it. You know, if you use VR for training, for, you know, um, aversion disorders, all sorts, there's some amazing things to use it. But where I think actually it will become more of a, a sort of a, a purchase path is when we get to more of a meaningful metaverse. So Roblox is mostly desktop at the moment. When it is developed and it's more of a virtual experience, NFTs, then people will want to go and buy you know, the hat. They will want to go and get the latest Nike you know, um, piece or what have you. So you know, then it will become part of a, a purchase path. But I think at the moment, it's, you know, it's less so. And it's not really, you shouldn't think of it as a sales channel or somewhere to sell. You know, it's um, got far more to offer than that. I think as well, just backing that up, is that the advisory solutions that are also out there, we also offer those. And also coach solutions seem to be an, an angle that people are actually swaying more towards. So the VTO is everybody's got VTO, like James and I said earlier. Some people just want to jump on the bandwagon because they're doing it, so we want it, but they don't really know what they want to get out of it at the end. However, when you look at an advisory solution, so that's actually, it's a product recommendation that's kicking in, then that's a totally different perspective, um, as in a coach solution. So once they've been advised about the, the, the skincare or the makeup, then it's a coach solution that's going to help guide and advise them as to how to use it and how to make the most out of it. Great. Anything to build? Or? Yeah, I mean, I guess the... the, the Virtual, you, you made a point about low quality, kind of cheap things that you're giving away hats in, in games. I mean, yes, to a degree, but some of these things do make a lot of money, you know, and I mean, $700,000 from $500 out, outlay is, is pretty great <laughs> from a business point of view. And I mean, you know, then they're going to sell them in store um, and they're going to make money from that. But then just take the hats out of the equation. How many children? between the ages of, you know, 8 and 12 now know about Forever 21 that didn't before, you know, and you put that across all sorts of different things in, in the metaverse. It's about building uh, rapport with that next generation, and, yeah, you might not make any, any immediate money out of it, but pay dividends in, in the years to come. And I think I saw another hand at the back there. Hey. Oh. Um... I think, I was just wondering, there, are, there is a, a real value in responsible consumption from AI. So the fact that you didn't buy that lipstick, it might not be a shade that does particularly well for them ever, and therefore they will reduce that shade in their overall portfolio and therefore be more sustainable and responsible in product manufacture, waste, etc., and the circular economy. I had a question around how do you see this world positively impacting outside of responsible consumption, sustainability, if, if at all. Um, because I also think, you know, I've got a little boy who loves Roblox, plays Bloxburg, wants Robux every week, um, and I love that I'm not buying him loads of plastic toot that's going to gather dust, so I feel very responsible by giving him his pocket money in Robux. Um, but yeah, I can see how it really supports responsible consumption to an extent, but I'd be interested to know any other headlines from a sustainability POV from this world. You really want to take that? Uh, I mean, you mentioned it, I think, in, in one of your case studies about, yeah. obviously, the tester yeah. piece. Like, I mean, if it can kind of reduce some of that need for testers in store, you know, which I think will take time, then that's, that's giving you a big sustainability uh, bump right there. Obviously, probably a bit of profitability bump as well, um, which would be great if it's both. Um, so I think there's that, there's that element, but it's a fairly small one. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem with the whole blockchain thing is obviously it's really bad for the environment. You know, it's the elephant in the room, but they are working on it every day, um, you know, trying to, to improve it. Lots of companies are already doing it much better than others. Um, so the whole thing is tainted slightly by that. But in terms of, you know, just, you know, just to go back to the same example again, you know, with Forever 21, it's like if you could harness it in that way, you could test products without having to actually physically make them mm -hmm. um, and test them with that kind of online community and, and see, what, see what works and, and then actually action the stuff that, that does work, then you're, you know, that's a great impact or, on the environment. 
And it helps make better formed um, decisions for like pre-production. Mm. Just like with, uh, I've, from a fashion background as well, working in the 3D design side, and it, it's very, very similar. So that basically you could pick your 100 top customers, you could share with them a collection for spring, summer, you could ask them to sample and see what they look like, and then at the end of a specific period, you decide out of those, say, 10 lipsticks, we're only going to go with four for next season. Is that the kind of question yeah yeah so I think I think it works from both ends I think it works from actually being the consumer and trying it on to be more sustainable because you're not over ordering either and then you've got wastage and then you've also got emissions from sending the package back for example but then from the back end you've got production and manufacturer who can use it for testing before they actually go to production and that's something I've flagged up with our uh, R&D team because I do think it's a real valuable point that you've mentioned. And you just rem reminded me of something else actually at that point. Um, I think we're talking to one, um, one client about a potential NFT loyalty program and, and one of the things we're suggesting is that you know, if you buy into this token gated community essentially you get access to lots of benefits, one of which would be you would get to play a role in shaping that company's first digital fashion collection for you know, Roblox for example. So you're actually getting your customers to you know, input into, into what the product would be. So you're getting that, you know, that customer feedback before the fact. And obviously then there, if it's successful, then you make, you know, you're, you're creating that loop. Great. Well, I'm conscious of time and that we also would love to invite you for a drink in the bar. So that leads me to close things and say a huge thank you very much to our panelists, to James, to Danielle and to Duncan. Thank you for joining us this evening. And thank you all for attending. Thank you.